Uh, I'd really like to introduce Dr. Simon Alwyn. Um, he is uh, one of the directors of Sea Search, um, together with his wife, Dr. Tess Gridley, um, and it's a lot of her work that will be spoken about today as well. Sea Search is a research-focused nonprofit organization based in Cape Town, um, but they conduct research on marine mammals throughout Southern Africa. Um, in, including Namibia and Mozambique. Their research has a strong focus on marine mammals and bioacoustic research methods and ranges from blue skies questions, those big questions and on animal behavior and culture, all the way through to ecological questions such as individual movement, distribution, density, and responses to noise and other human impacts. We, we are working from Namibia to Mozambique, and the work I'm talking about today is only a small part of that, and it's a work that is, has, has been affected, or not affected, been supported, and is a result of work by a number of other people. The nature of working a team means we need a lot of assistance in the, in the ocean on the field, and, and we really have relied a lot on our team members who have been various students, technicians, and postdocs. And I'm basically talking to work that started back in 2015, and it formed the, uh, the foundation of several master's degrees for Monique, Tevia, uh, and Kat, and Shireen, and Alexa, and Erin have worked as NRF interns, and we've collected data from a, a number of different sources. So there's a bit of a story in some ways, um, in that what sort of motivated the project for me in 2015 when I moved back to Cape Town from working in Namibia was that the area we're working in is quite uh, quite globally unique, and it's, it forms a biogeographic boundary between the cold waters of the Benguela and the warmer waters of the eastern uh, eastern coast of South Africa. And there's an area where you might expect climate change uh, to really have an effect. And I'm sure you've all seen headlines like this, hot year on record, 100-year flood, or another 100-year flood, or another 100-year flood. We, are, we don't need to pretend anymore. I think everybody in this audience and, and most people globally are, are very aware that climate change is happening. And we're dealing more in a situation of how do we, how do we mitigate that and minimize the impacts rather than, than stopping it. The general pattern Globally, is that there is strong warming, except of course for Washington DC, oddly, which explains a lot of the denial over there. But here in Africa, we're going to be suffering a lot of warming over the next few years. Except oddly, if you look at the ocean, the, this graph or this figure shows it's from a material royals work, and they show some expected, some known patterns. So these are patterns that have been measured already. That we get a lot of cooling around our western, uh, around the Western Cape, particularly to do with strong winds. So there's been some very interesting patterns, and, and that really makes this biogeographic boundary that we're working with here in the, in the Cape Point area particularly interesting. Dolphins and whales are very wide ranging to predators, so in some ways they're not the ideal species to, to investigate, but there has been some work. And then Colin McLeod produced a paper a few years back. And based on the global review of ranges and temperature limits and things like that, uh, he calculated 88% of whale and dolphin species would, would be affected by climate change, and 21% are potentially affected by, uh, may, may face extinction, 21% of species. Possibly a little bit high, but it's particularly these species that live in the subtropical region, and particularly those that are, live on the continental shelf. You note here around the western side of southern Africa, there's a several species that have a range extension of the cold waters of the Benguela, and that includes things like the pygmy right whale and the southern right whale dolphin. And the, the cold, nutrient-rich waters of the Benguela essentially provide an extension of southern, southern um, subtropical, not subtropical, southern Arctic species. And as climate change uh, progresses, these are sort of patterns we, we might expect. So the species we have associated with the Benguela are potentially amongst those most at risk from climate change. And that's really why we were interested in looking at um, the area around the Western Cape. Those of you who don't know, this area around Southern Africa, because of this combination of cold West Coast habitat and warm East Coast habitat and, and sort of tropical, uh, tropical habitat when you start to get up to the Far East Coast, we have incredibly high diversity of cetacean species. That's both in the baleen whales, and that's the ones that have baleen in feed, and the toothed whales and dolphins that includes everything from um, uh, river dolphins and coastal and oceanic dolphins up to the sperm whales. 
So we really do have, uh, we really are sitting on a uh, globally unique high level of biodiversity here. <clears throat> Those of you who are familiar with the ocean around the, the Cape Coast or on the South African coast, really, we have three species of whale that we regularly see, and that's the Brooders whale, which is in fact resident to our waters, the southern right whale, which is migratory to South Africa. They are now essentially leaving our shores after, after a winter spent carving here, and the humpback whale, which theoretically migrates past South African shores and to, to breed off the warm waters of Mozambique and sort of Angola and Gabon on the west coast. But uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the results we've got from, from humpback whales later in this talk today. I'm not really going to touch on these two. So this work really started looking at, at dolphins. Uh, we also have two species of, you know, they are dolphins, a hump, killer whale is a dolphin and a common dolphin, which range widely across the continental shelf. But the real focus of this work was on the coastal dolphins. So this, this figure shows sea surface temperatures, the sort of long-term average of sea surface temperatures. And you really see the sort of warm east coast, temperate south coast, and cool west coast. And that's reflected in the species of dolphin we have around our coast. On the east coast, in terms of coastal dolphins, that's the ones that we see very close to shore. They sit on the back line of the surf that you'll see while surfing or from the beach are the bottlenose dolphin, the Indo-Pacific bottlenose. And you can see its range, range, you know, in the Southern African regions from Mozambique, it extends all the way up. So Mozambique down to about Cape Point. The humpback dolphin, similarly from the East Coast, these are records somewhere down to about Cape Point. And these are published um, ranges in Peter Best's Whale and Dolphin book. And on the West Coast, we have a similar situation with the dusky dolphin ranging down to around Cape Point and the heavy-sized dolphin ranging to around Cape Point. Uh, when you actually start to dig into it a little more closely, it turns out there was a remarkable lack of cetacean data around Cape Town. And this was back around 2015 when we started this work. So we think the range, uh, we were almost certain that the range boundary is being driven by this, uh, these sort of temperature boundaries. We see that are particularly strong in summer. Uh, in summer in the False Bay, Cape Peninsula area, you can have a 10 degree difference between False Bay and Hout Bay. And that's really, you know, it's a 15 minute car drive. It's really quite a unique area to work. So we thought it's going to be a fascinating area to really try and try and sort of tease out exactly what's driving these range limits in these species. Is it purely temperature? Is it prey availability? Turns out it's harder than it looks, especially given that we started with very little data. So what we did, we managed to get some funding out of the National Research Foundation for this, which was really fantastic, including two master's students. And so Monique Laubscher used um, boat server data, which for us in the, in the marine mammal field is very normal. We drive our boat around, which is standard technique. I mean, we drive our boat around and we record what we see. We try and cover all the, the key areas, but it's quite a large habitat. Xavier Latreet worked on a combination of opportunistic data, so using data that we could get from other data sources, uh, I'll show you now, and also doing interview techniques and then we also use acoustic monitoring. This was supposed to be worked on by a PhD student, but she unfortunately uh, left due to personal reasons early into the project. And so in some ways it's lagging, but in other ways, this uh, passive acoustic monitoring has sort of diversified quite substantially. And the data set's been worked on by a number of different people. So this is kind of what the data looks like. We go out and draw, draw a, uh, drive a boat all over, drawing lines in the ocean. You can see a lot of our effort was focused coastally in False Bay and, and on the West Coast because that's, those are the species we were very interested in. We had hydrophones moored in four locations in False Bay and two up the West Coast. We collated data from a range of different people, including uh, Chris Fellows and the Shark Spotters and Die Island uh, Whale Watching Companies. The Safari app was developed by Alex Fogel sort of early in this project and, and really helped us with collating a lot of data. And then we did interview service as part of uh, Tibia's work. So this was quite an interesting uh, program for me to develop uh, personally because a lot of my work in the past um, has, has, has used the sort of standard boat-based surveys and passive acoustic monitoring. And we really tried, uh, really tried our best uh, to get a lot of uh, data in. And over three years, we had 162 encounters, which is very good sample size. But by collating data from other people and the sort of citizen science approach and collating opportunistic data, uh, it's something that has really sort of been, been taking off for the last few years, especially the development of uh, sighting apps and the bird atlas and things like that. But it's still less common in the marine field than it is in, say, the birding field. And we ended up with nearly 15,000 encounters over 21 years. And see, we had a significant increase uh, in sample size compared to what we could collect on our own. And then... <sighs> 
even better, well, or sort of on a par with that, is asking people. So this, the, the top right, is data from people. We know we saw this dolphin on that day, whereas the bottom right is interview data, whereas what Tevia did was she interviewed people uh, and asked them where they were at tea, how often over the year and over the, over the month, within that year, they, they were at tea. And we added all that up spatially and over time, and we ended up with an effort map that looks like this. So you can see these sort of long tongues out here are, are associated with guys we interviewed that were part of the cleaner fishing, they head off Cape Point. A lot of these were people doing um, uh, shore-based diving or fishing and whale watching operators and kayak operators. So we still ended up with a high effort around the harbors. And the results of this are actually quite fascinating. I've, I've really enjoyed the data set and a sort of nine-tenths prep for publication at the moment. So just to show you, this is the effort. So this is where the people we interviewed went to sea. We had a few whale watches down there in um, Walker Bay and Island Trust. And if you look at the data of where those people reported seeing certain species, you can see the common dolphins, which we know are a, um, a pelagic species that range widely across the shelf. That is reflected in both the raw number of observers reporting those that species and when we control for, for effort. Uh, you can see their distribution is reflected quite widely across the study area. And for heavy sized dolphins, we're really on paper. If you, if you look at some sort of the species, the, the red international red list or Peter's book, the range end is listed as uh, Cape Point. But in reality, the range end of the species is, is Hout Bay. Um, and, and very few animals hang out in Hout Bay, but there's a high density area around Table Bay. We had not a single report uh, of people regularly seeing them in False Bay or to the east. Conversely, the humpback dolphin, which occurs on the east coast of, the, of South Africa, and again, the range limit is listed as either Cape Agullis or Cape Point. We only had reports from False Bay and eastwards. So this is just based on um, people reporting data, reporting their sightings, and it's, a, it's an incredibly useful tool and something we, we aim to develop, especially when working in new areas, if we extend work into Africa. And it's becoming more widely recognized, and it's something that, that for me was a new technique, and I found a very interesting result. And just to delve into these two species a little bit more, heavy sites and humpback dolphins. So these are the raw data of sightings from heavy sides dolphins from different uh, different um, uh, data sets, PhD data, um, opportunistic data, platforms of opportunity. And you can see we have a little cluster down at Table Bay, but very, very, very few sightings south of Hout Bay, barring one out of range sighting from the whale watches in, in, in Dyer Island there, or what is it, they're claimed by. Um, and the, the sort of observer or the interview data really followed that very closely and the survey data from our own boat all 160 something sightings that we had so this is in green uh, so poorly chosen color scheme um, but it matches exactly we have a cluster of sightings here and a cluster of sightings so this is really great there were these three different data sets from you know essentially they were operated in parallel and they came up with almost exactly the same answers. And it allowed us to refine the range in from Cape Point to um, actually refine that a lot more closely to, to what we think it really is, which is sort of petering off very rapidly south of, essentially south of Sea Point, uh, with a little cluster of animals seen in Hout Bay. On the east side, with the humpback dolphins, we had very similar uh, sort of accuracy on uh, if, you, if you look at the sort of published range back in 2007, which was the last published range, it was really reported that west of Cape Agullis, humpback dolphins were very rare. But we know from work we've done that actually sightings were very common in Walker Bay and particularly around Clane Bay area here, which is where there's a whale watching operator that keeps good records. And records into False Bay were thought to be incredibly rare. But the challenge with this species is that they are incredibly coastal in their in their range and a lot of people don't see them so the people who are working on Cecil Island which is just about 5k's offshore here almost never see humpback dolphins because this is what the raw data look like we just produced this because in the last few weeks we've had a sort of exciting what we think is exciting a uh, range extension of the species very small range extension but these triangles are, are reports or sightings that we've got through from safari or shark spotters reports these dots are us following groups of dolphins around for several hours while recording them see usually when we see them they tend to stay in one area and there's fairly regular sightings of the front fountain area and the west of my sighting that was of musenberg we literally got to the end of the beach the dolphins turned around and they went east again and we thought wow this, this is quite an incredible area to work that you'd be sitting in musenberg and you're, you're literally looking at the end of a species range 
And then, of course, in the last few weeks, um, that will change slightly in that we're now starting, we, we've had a group of four and it later became a group of 10 hanging out as far south as Glen Cairn. And interestingly, those animals were associated with a strong color front, which seemed to be made up of slightly warmer water. So when you, when you look at these sort of the other species, the dusky dolphins and the bottlenose, they both range a little bit further. We get bottlenose up to Timestown and Smithsonian and dusky dolphins, which are also a little bit more pelagic, they, they come up to fish with some regularity. Whereas the heavy side, excuse me, and the um, humpback dolphin are slightly more limited in, in their range boundaries. So al although this project isn't finished, um, we are we are really we are starting to to tease together the, the sort of different layers of what is affecting these animals. And, and of course, like almost everything in biology, is multiple factors. Temperature is definitely playing a role. Heavy side dolphins are, are seen very, very rarely in this cold upwelling water that we get south of Hart Bay. And partly that's a temperature issue and partly it's because there's lower prey availability for the species there. They feed on hake primarily, which tends to be further north. And humpback dolphins certainly we know are strongly associated with the sort of habitat of sandy beaches and, and, they, and they don't like, and this is at a, at a global level, they tend to be very rare or fast along very rocky shores. So they seem to move mainly along rocky shores and hang out of sandy beaches and especially river mouths. And so it's this combination of, of water temperature that is warm with a nice sandy habitat and moving south of that, the dolphins just seem to presumably cue in on the set of indicators of temperature and habitat type and possibly a change in, in prey availability. Bear in mind, you'll see a lot of kelp here. So for an East Coast species suddenly encountering kelp, uh, it must be an obvious, obvious cue in the environment. So we're going to see where, where this data goes. We still need to, to pull in all the acoustic data, which is where I'm going to step slightly sideways and introduce you to some of the results we got from the acoustic component of the study. So we had hydrophones or fishhook, Smith and Bay, Strand Fontaine. We had those out quite, uh, quite well. Uh, and, uh, and a short to deploy in a royal, so it was just logistically harder. More recently, we've had hydrophones off the West Coast, which are linked more with a humpback whale project. So how do we analyze hydrophone data? This is typically what you, you get back from a recording. If you're not familiar with it, look at the bottom image. This is what we call a spectrogram, and it shows sound over time. So along the x-axis, we have time. And over the y-axis, frequency from low frequencies at the bottom to high frequencies at the, at the top. So this spectrogram shows only sounds that are audible to humans. We can hear probably twice as high as that. Um, you know, I'm just playing some of that in the background. What you can also do with this data, which is a great way to visualize it, is to essentially compress a very long time frame into a single image. And that's called a long-term spectrogram. And that's what we've done here. Um, and you can see this top figure represents 160 hours. You can do this for an entire year. But when searching for sounds of things like dolphins, they really pop out. If you look at a sort of about a 10 or 30 minute window, you can really pull out the dolphins quite nicely and also humpback whale song. This band of noise here is actually associated mostly with snapping shrimp, which is if you ever have a GoPro video or stick your head underwater in a kelp forest, you just hear constant crackle, crackle, crackle. And I hear it in the, the background of a lot of the recordings. And it really is a very dominant sound in the um, uh, in the soundscape of, of the Western Cape, particularly. So we, we had Alexa Printlew, uh, we had her as a research assistant for a few months, and she pulled out all the dolphin species. And, and we, we really battled to find dolphins during the boat surveys. We would regularly um, have days with weeks, even with, with no dolphin sighted. And when Alexa started going through, through the hydrophones, she said, no, no, the dolphins are almost every day, coming out with something like two encounters a day. So basically, she was pulling out dolphins and separating them uh, by an hour, saying if there's an hour gap, it's a new encounter. And this is really quite an astounding average. At each of those hydrophones, we're getting an average of two, one and a half to two encounters a day. And the, the striking difference was that uh, spatially, so these are the one, two, three, four hydrophones. Spatially, we had much longer encounters, up to an hour, two hours of dolphins just hanging around the hydrophones here. And I, I very seriously questioned her based on my experience. I was like, I, you, something's wrong for me. Please prove this to me. And um, turns out the pattern is that all, almost all those encounters were at night. So these figures show diurnal pattern changes. So from midnight through to uh, where we ate in the morning around here, middle of the day, 5, 6 p.m. And these are dolphin encounters. So Fishuk, you can see high frequency of encounters overnight, almost nothing in the day, and then they come back at night. 
very similar pattern in Smithfinkel, in Strandfontein, which is the north of the bay, um, uh, a much more consistent pattern over time, and, and Royals, we had a shorter data set. And so the reason we hardly ever saw dolphins is this is sort of what our, our effort looks like for boat service. We typically launch a boat at seven, get out of the harbor around eight o'clock, and you know, be back sometime in the afternoon. So acoustic monitoring, and one of the reasons I'm showing you this, so the next time you see these figures, we will have this broken down by species. That's that's been the one hold up of this project. Unfortunately, we're losing the PhD student. We we've been a bit held up on the results. So the next time I show you this figure, it'll it'll be broken down by the species. We have four different species of dolphin in the bay: the bottlenose dolphin, dusky dolphin, humpback dolphin, and the common dolphin. And occasionally, just to really mix things up, clue whales. So this is quite an important from a park management or from a general uh, impact assessment type of point of view in that if, if we based everything we know on either opportunistic data, interview data, or even, um, even our own scientific survey data, which historically I would have said would be the strongest data set, the patterns we observed are that there were very few dolphins uh, in the time period in some in Bells Bay, but not currently we're getting an almost completely different pattern. That, that's quite, quite an important um, implication from a management point of view. So, so the next interesting result that we've only very recently really pulled out of this acoustic data, and it's been led by Tess and her student, Shireen uh, Bala, who's at Oxford University, that she's just handed in. So this is very preliminary data. So a lot of work globally looking at the impacts of FIPS on wildlife uh, through either direct impacts, presence, the physical presence, or through the noise impact, which is very important in the field of whales and dolphins, which are very acoustically sensitive is based on commercial, commercial vessels, which are usually tracked to a system called AIS, uh, which commercial vessels, so that's usually fishing, uh, uh, container vessels, et cetera. They all have these beacons and you, you can download these maps where you can screenshot these maps for free. If you want the raw data, you've got to pay a substantial amount for it. But a lot of this kind of data has been used in the marine spatial planning um, and EBSA development, et cetera, for South Africa and Namibia. And if you look at the False Bay area, if you're familiar with it, you see very clearly we've got this track of these are probably all the tuna vessels and this is commercial shipping coming around Cape Point here. And just looking at some of the data we pulled out from the Smith Finkel Hydrophone, just a little snapshot. So here we have the long-term spectrogram of, of all the data pulled together. These little dot separate recordings. So they were five minutes on, five minutes off, five minutes on, five minutes off, because that allowed us to, to double the deployment duration. So these sort of slight little gaps. And this is what a boat looks like coming past. It's a sort of gradual increase and then a real, whoa, as it, as it goes past and completely swamps the recording in certain frequencies. And that becomes quite an important pollution impact for, um, for acoustically sensitive animals like dolphins. And so if you only use AIS, you get a skewed picture towards commercially available vessels. But there's, there's been actually only one paper I'm aware of from Denmark showing that a lot of the noise in the coastal environment is driven by these small boat sounds. So almost all these small boat all this boat noise in the bottom left here um, is almost sitting from small boats like uh, snook vessels or private charters or even the whale watching boats, which don't have AIS or, or the dive boats, etc. And Smithsonian is a very busy, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a popular dive site and it's a sensitive thoroughfare. There's a lot of boats launched at Simonstown and Miller's Point. They just gun it out here and they go fishing in Buffalo Bay or out of the point. So that's taking a little snapshot and showing you the utility of acoustic data um, from a sort of management and, and park management point of view. This is a period over New Year in 2016. And you can see uh, these are dates, 12, 29, 30th of December, 31st of December, everybody's out fishing, number of boats, 40, 50, and that's boat passes. So you can assume maybe it's 20 out and 20 back. Um, apparently on New Year, everybody was at home hungover and nobody launched their boats. This was, in fact, a Sunday, hence everybody then went out and took the boats out to sea again. Monday, dropped back off, and then sort of picked up to, I guess, more normal levels. You can see, knockingly, I had a lot of diurnal patterns uh, from midnight, one in the morning, through to midnight again. Very few people out at night, or none at night over this period. A clear peak, early fishermen, sort of divers, and whoever out in the middle of the day. But somebody was out at two in the morning. Um, unfortunately, the hydrophones we use are, um, uh, they're called archival, they record everything internally, so we only get the data back after we've pulled them out of the water and have downloaded them. Um, but it is feasible to use acoustic monitoring like this in a, 
in a uh, many, uh, so to, in a sort of alert in a sorry my brain stopped briefly. <laughs> it's feasible to use acoustic monitoring like this to alert for the presence of boats overnight, such as poachers. Um, and it's been used widely, and there's, there's various videos available on our YouTube channel from the acoustic bioacoustics conference that, that speak very much to this acoustic monitoring for poaching on and, and terrestrial parks it's being used for gunshot monitoring of poachers and chainsaw monitoring in rainforests it's not used around southern africa for marine monitoring but it's certainly something that that could be a very useful tool in terms of alerting to the presence of boats at night or number of boats passing through an area you can also summarize the thing that bottom left hand spectrogram um, you, you can summarize this data over extended periods of time and really look at where the peak power densities are. So in these figures, the data is kind of flipped on its side and you have acoustic frequency along the x-axis and uh, power, sound pressure level, essentially you can think of this as, as cumulative loudness over time. And you can see there's quite a different pattern. So these sort of power spectral densities are used, uh, increasingly used in looking at soundscapes, which is trying to summarize all the sound in an area. And you get very different patterns between, say, areas where there's uh, high boat traffic, which is quite a strong peak, areas where you might have um, a peak in whale sounds, or uh, in Sanfontaine, a lot of this peak here is driven by background wave noise. So, so it's really um, a, an interesting way and a, and a powerful way to compare sites over time. You can see at Smith and Bay, we had so what is this, 10 to the 3 is 1,000, so 1 kilohertz up to 10 kilohertz. We had quite a, a strong peak here, which is largely driven by the snapping shrimp in that area. It's a lot of pristine reef and a lot of snapping shrimp. Smith, a uh, Sanfontaine, we have a strong peak here, which seems to be largely associated with the background wave noise. So you can really start to tease out these differences, and this is part of Shireen Bala's MS, MSC, and this is work we are aiming to publish in the next few weeks. So in terms of talking about acoustics and, and where, where we're taking this, we, we got a little held up on the dolphins. Uh, we started to produce some very interesting results out of the long-term recordings, and, and this is now from a data set that we will, are extending over time. But then I'm going to entirely honestly and say we got slightly distracted by humpback whales um, a year or two, a few years back. And we've always done a lot of work on humpback whales based on our work in Namibia and my, my sort of historic um, career interests. And Tess was the first to pick up the first, Tess was the first to notice the presence of song in humpback whale supergroups. So this was really interesting. It was just a little note that was produced. Uh, it was actually recorded off the Algoa on one of the cruises run by the Department of Environmental Affairs. It was recorded by Chris um, and, and Du and, and Tess did the work on this. And it was the first description of humpback song from South Africa. This is interesting because humpback whales are widely known for the song. If anybody thinks about uh, Singing whales, it's almost always humpback whale song that you're thinking of because it's been very widely publicized. And it's something that biologically should happen, as with everything in biology, there's what should happen based on the textbook from 20 or 30 years ago and what actually happens. Biologically, we don't expect humpback song in any great numbers around the South African coast. We are on the migration route. Whales should be passing by us. We might pick up the odd animal singing, and that's sort of what this note was out there. And we expect main, the main thing into your sort of the warm tropical breeding areas like Mozambique and Angola. Um, but humpback whale song is particularly interesting because it's culturally learned by individuals. So it's not inherited biologically like bird song. They, they learn it from their peers effectively. And because of that, you get quite uh, clear differences over time and over space. And humpback whales from separate populations sing different songs. And so when looking through the, the data from um, Salt Bay, Alexa started to pick out quite a lot of humpback song. And James Hawkey, who volunteered with us for a few months, put the effort in and, and started to sort of tease out and describe the, the, um, the structure of the song. It, we were a bit challenged in that we had the five minute on, five minute off recording schedule. So we had to break the song down. And uh, it's really quite a haunting sound. And from a few years back when we thought, oh, humpback whales don't sing here, to, oh, maybe one does, one or two do sing here, we, we picked up quite a lot here in False Bay to the point where it is now um, being detected very regularly at certain times of year. I'll stop talking so you can enjoy that if you can hear it. Hear the grumble and wiggle. And there's a particularly interesting call here. 
Excelente testemunho. So these are what we call different themes, and the song of the humpback whale. Sorry, a bit confusing. <laughs> Too many playing at the same time. Um, and the different themes make up the song overall, um, and the song is then also made up of different segments. And so this is going to allow us down the line to explore the changes in the, in the song over time. And we've also got a few projects we're collaborating with researchers from other parts of the world, Brazil and, um, uh, and the Southwest Indian Ocean, looking at potential song. And Erin, who wrote up the next paper um, on humpback whale song, is, is hoping to do a PhD in this. So Erin then, Erin Ross Marsh, took this a, a step further and started to get the occurrence of song data in our in our long-term recordings from Pulse Day. How are we doing for time? This is okay. Um, and unfortunately, our recordings were a little bit messy over time. Logistically, it just got really challenging because we had to dive the hydrophones in and out. We had a, a good period and then a few recorded together. So we didn't have brilliant overlap. But we ended up with a pretty good data set in terms of days recorded. And you can see the song uh, percentage of days recorded or, or the number of days recorded was, was relatively few. Um, and the majority of song was in fact, so the, sort of the key results really were that um, the majority of song recorded was between September and October, which interestingly is the southward migration. So the animals are moving north in June when you might expect practice song. So we think these animals that are, that are singing, we're picking up singing in September, October, are either on their way south from the breeding ground already or potentially are making partial migration. Um, and one of the other interesting patterns, again, which interestingly supports uh, what we saw in the dolphins, and we're now also picked this up in the, some of the new recordings Aaron's looked at, is that there's also, most of the singing is taking place at night. So if you ever happen to do a night dive in the False Bay area or the West Coast, you might well hear humpback whale singing, but especially around that September and October period. So one of the, the, the two other interesting things that came out of this it's, it wasn't just a one-off occasion we recorded multiple singers we Aaron fairly regularly logged uh, two singers at a time because what it looks like it gets a bit confusing it just sounds like I played by accident two slides back we had two songs at the same time uh, it all just looks like a bit of a mess but here here she's highlighted out singer one and then singer two and the other cool thing that really came out of this is where are the singers, right? So we picked up most of the song at Smithfinkel, which is the most southwest, is the closest to the, the bay mouth, effectively. Um, but the same song was recorded a few seconds later in Fishhook and even over there in Strandfontein. So the trade line distance is about 20 kilometers, I think, between Smithfinkel and Strandfontein. So I think a lot of the singers are, are potentially sitting in the, in the mouth of the bay, effectively, or potentially even outside the mouth of the bay. But it really gives you a, a perspective on how loud the songs are of these whales, uh, that they are traveling tens of kilometers. Conversely, the social sounds that may travel much less. I'll talk about that in two slides. So while we're out there looking for dolphins, trying to understand the, the ranges, we're a little bit distracted by humpback whale song, but we also record all the whale presence and um, identities that feeds into general projects we're working on in the background. When you work on humpback whales, the, the main way to identify individuals is either through photos of the dorsal fin, but the global standard is through changes, um, these black and white patterns that are, are born, the, the whales are born with on their tail flukes. Theoretically, well, essentially, essentially every single whale has a different pattern and it's very widely uh, widely used tool to monitor humpback whales. And one of the nicest tools that's become available in the last few years, thanks to sort of various automated uh, matching algorithms that are becoming available for machine learning and other tools is through the Happy Whale platform, happywhale.com. Um, it started initially with, with work in the Antarctic as a way to encourage people who are on, on commercial Antarctic tours to submit their sightings through catalog. And it's extended to a lot of scientists in the North Pacific are, are really using it widely and around Australia. It's particularly geared towards sort of public and data sharing, but it's used increasingly by scientists. And here around Southern Africa, you can see we've um, started to, to load up. I'll show you that in a second. Um, there's also another platform called Flutebook that we're working with. I uh, haven't started loading data in there yet, but th we're working with Flutebook. It's kind of about who you collaborate with, really. Locally, everyone's kind of settled on Happy Whale, but we're going to be loading our data into Facebook as well. And that's particularly to look at sightings up into the Southwest Indian Ocean. There's a, there's a collaboration of people here in the Southwest Indian Ocean called Indoset, 
who, who are working through Sleepbook. <clears throat> uh, so there's some of the sightings. If you, you can just log into happywell.com and these have been loaded by ourselves uh, through Safari. So Alex Vogel, who, who operates Safari, uh, is collating a lot of data actually from shore-based observations. Um, there's a couple of keen photographers in the Fox Bay um, sightings network who, who are getting usable photos from shore and those are being fed in through, through Alex. Uh, Dave Hewitt, the Samsung Boat Company, started to load in a few of his sightings and also from Captain Jack. So a lot of this work has also been done um, by Danny Abris. And you can see these lines are showing the sightings. There's been already one sighting through across Walker Bay. Quite a lot of sightings in this feeding area. These are our sightings or our sightings and re-sightings and we still have a, a lot of data to, to upload. So it's a really simple e system to use and fun to use. It's only based on at the moment, but we're going to extend that soon to um, also things. <clears throat> so the reason I'm showing you this, it, it's not false bay, but the, there's a lot of humpback whales moving between the West Coast National Park um, and the Saldana area and false bay uh, that we know of. And it's not just humpbacks, we also have a lot of sightings of southern right whales. Most of those are around the peninsula at the moment because further up the coast they tend to be further offshore. So this is based on data I collected for WWF at the end of last year, trying to look at the overlap of right of, of whales with crab fisheries. And so we highlighted out these core areas of concern. We know that right whales and humpbacks are both feeding in these upwelling cells. These are areas of real concern. And the brood whales are feeding mainly on pelagic fish, so they have a, a different seasonality. And the key thing that, that I want to highlight out of this is that when you talk about whales in South Africa, there's this paradigm of whale season, which is very much centered around southern right whales and their historic patterns. And that's that, oh, right, whales, whales are in Hermanus in winter. Um, and although that was very true 10, 20 years ago, the feeding grounds on the West Coast have really developed uh, in terms of numbers and um, uh, an extent of the season. And it's not just humpbacks, it's right whales and brooders whales, which were historically uh, very rare on the west, west of Cape Point, are now being seen with great regularity in the Table Bay area. And interestingly, the seasonality is quite different. They're peaking in September in Table Bay, whereas almost everyone on the East Coast, their numbers peak during the summer months with sardine. And you can see we get this peak, EA, sorry, EA is um, right whales, Eublain Australis. Uh, in February, March, April, we get the strong peak of right whales in the Table Bay area, so which is on, on the within the Table Mountain National uh, Marine Protected Area. And these... <clears throat> These um, numbers are, are just not, I don't feel that they've really filtered through to the, the management authorities involved. We, we now have very high numbers of right whales, of humpback whales, and increasingly of brooders whales on the west coast, particularly in Table Bay, but also up here uh, in even higher numbers north of Dutton Island. The, we, the seasonality on the west coast is different to the standard paradigm of whale season. We're seeing mating of right whales in False Bay. We've seen extensive feeding of humpback whales and uh, and right whales in both Table Bay and up here up the west, further up the west coast. We're getting regular resightings of individuals, and we're also starting to, to get some residents. A few years back, 20, 2019, we actually had six juvenile humpbacks that were essentially resident in, in False Bay. So a lot of what what I think the public thinks of as this is what whales do is is not really the case anymore. We've seen a lot of changes, which are due to population level changes. Um, and, and this is what the feeding grounds look like on the west coast for the humpback whales. Uh, amazingly, this hasn't yet completely sort of piqued the interest of the tourism industry, but it really is a globally unique phenomenon. These are what are termed supergroups. It was a term uh, used by Ken Findlay in, in a sort of paper describing in 2017. We know that humpback whales have been uh, feeding on the west coast Forever, whaling catches were, were taking place in summer months, but the sort of extent has really gone from 20 or 30 whales in that we were seeing in groups in, in the early 2000s to groups of hundreds of animals, and this is happening now. Mostly it's happening a few cases of course. There's not, not seen that much by, by shore-based observers, but these groups um, are, are a phenomenon and, and a wonderful phenomenon and a tourist opportunity and filming groups are interested in them, but it's also a bit of a, a concern. Um, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, oops, gonna have to wrap up soon. Um, so a lot of our work on these super groups, we're, we're looking at acoustic communication. Uh, we're particularly interested in looking at the feeding 
behaviors of these animals. It's, it gives us globally unique access to feeding southern hemisphere whales. Otherwise, you have to go to the southern ocean. We also get incredible sample size in terms of whales access and sounds. If we look at some of the other papers that are looking at tag dates or social or non-song sounds of humpback whales, um, they're looking at you know a few sounds. Uh, we're, we're getting tens of sounds. So, we, so it's really an incredible place to get to work. The scale of the phenomenon is, is quite new and it's still not widely recognized, but um, it, there's major potential for human wildlife conflict. So one of the, the goals for us with this work, and we very recently heard from the National Research Foundation, get this WAP sound. This is one of the common contact wall calls. So the goals for us with this work has just been funded for the next few years by the NRF. So we're trying to complete this work describing the repertoire of sounds and how that changes over time in area. So these social sounds are quite different. They're not nearly as well studied as, as song uh, in humpback whales. And we, we're hoping to link certain sounds to, to behaviors like uh, surfacing. We already have some in, indications from Cat Naden's work that they might make these whop sounds and grumble whops just before they surface in these supergroups. Um, I haven't heard any of that data yet. The paper's in, in, in review at the moment. Um, and, and one of the areas that I, I'm very interested in developing is, is this acoustic monitoring on these animals as a, as a potential mitigation tool to make boaters aware and port authorities, et cetera, of whale presence. Uh, and a lot of the work we're doing now is linking sort of the presence of whales, how many whales are there to the, to the sounds they're making. Uh, can we link the number of sounds to the number of whales or the types of sound to specific behaviors like feeding? And are the animals using sound within these groups? So that's where we're going. And hopefully in a year or two, we'll be able to present some, some cool results on that. Um, but I, I want to end this sort of highlighting the, um, the, the, the human wildlife conflict angle of it. The photograph is taken of Saldana. You can see the iron ore thingy in the background there. Um, we have 20, this was taken last year, where 20, 30 whales sitting in the mouth of the bay and these huge uh, bulk carriers coming in and out. Uh, during the two weeks we spent there trying to do a pilot study, we had four very, very close encounters of ship strikes. Uh, ship strikes and whales are an increasing phenomenon. Uh, you see the propeller cuts on this animal here. This one was chopped up uh, by a considerably large propeller and literally chopped in half. Whales and beaches have a significant cost to the city to have to remove. They have an environmental cost. Uh, it's an ethical issue. It's hey, illegal Martha, to kill so animals. Um, sorry. Um, and yeah, so that's something that maybe is a conversation you're the right audience to have. And I think there's definitely scope for something like a dog watches network and acoustic monitoring. And this is something that needs to be flagged with Table Mountain National Park, uh, with the city authority. And, and there is a recognition of it, but from what I can tell, it hasn't really been discussed yet. Um, really sort of looking at taking a proactive approach. Uh, also last week, we had a whale entangled in uh, one of the aquaculture farms, the mussel farms up in Saldana Bay. And so although we now have some great news and that the whale stocks have recovered and we have this incredible opportunity to research the sounds and cultural communication, uh, cultural inheritance of, of these of these interesting animals, um, with greater numbers of whales comes greater human wildlife conflict. And I think that's obviously something that national parks deal with quite a lot. So I'm going to end, uh, end it there and just say thank you uh, to all the Co well, I've just put Tess as a co-author already. She's led most of the acoustic work. But thanks again to all the students whose work I represented, Erin and James and Shireen, et cetera, uh, Kat's work. And uh, to the funders, most of this work was funded through the National Research Foundation grant, also through having NRF interns, and to the Sandpark team for letting us work in the marine protected area. And this was work done when I was a postdoc or research fellow at Victoria. Tess was a postdoc, but we are now both uh, with Stillamook University. Thank you very much.